Hey students, and welcome to module five, sex and gender. So today we're gonna to be talking about the topic of, as I just said, sex and gender and looking at it from the sociological perspective. So essentially what we're gonna be doing is looking how does the social sciences in particular, how does sociology view things such as sex, view things such as gender and the various statuses and roles that we play within this field and social construction as well as categorization. So. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to take you through this and go through the conversations on this. Uh, by the way, a little fun little thing, if you are curious about the background of this, uh, my wife's an engineer architect and she actually built this um, kind of dynamic called wellness working. I just thought it was a fun little fact on here if you think it's cool. But anyway, allow me to share my screen and we will get going with this. All right. so. Hopefully you are ready to learn and sorry that it took so long. So we're going to be talking about in this module five, sex and gender. Essentially, we're going to be breaking down, as I mentioned, the sociological categories that we are looking at with pertaining to both sex and what is gender and what are the roles and the statuses that we uphold and do and act in every single day life. Starting with this, I want to have a conversation around and let's just get this off the bat, the idea of what is sex. So as we talked about the understanding of sex and gender, it is important to separate what that which is socially constructed and that which is also used for classification. I mentioned this in the beginning of the lecture when I said that we're gonna look at these two different dynamic sex within sociology is broken down between two primary understandings, two. And that is broken down as a primary sex characteristic and secondary sex characteristic, as you can see on the slide. Now, what does that mean really pertaining? Well, primary sex characteristics are simple. And I mean this in a kind of easy sense to understand. This means reproductive organs. So this means for women, we are speaking about the vagina and for men, we're talking about the penis. It is as limited and as simple as this when we speak about the classification or the idea of establishing sex. Now it is worth mentioning that the idea of intersex at birth, and this is only impacting statistically according to experts, 1.7% of the population. So this is a very small group of people that are born in this type of situation, born intersex, having both chromosomes, right? Having both reproductive organs. It's a small portion, but it's also worth mentioning, even with this small amount of representation of the population, there is a lack of understanding, which has led to many people whom are intersex being massively underrepresented and also misunderstood. So I think it's interesting to talk about this, but for the sake of simplicity, we're going to refer to sex as broken down as two primary sex characteristics, and that is going to be based upon the genitalia, or in this case from women, vagina, men, penis. This is the breakdown of what is seen as the primary sex characteristic when categorizing. Now, tying from there, obviously, we have to talk about what is the second. Well, the secondary sex characteristic can be easily understood as bodily patterns used to make assumptions about a person's sex. So you're trying to make quick evaluations so that we understand how we manage our impression and how we engage in this conversation. Now, it is still assumed to mean that this can lead to misrepresentation, mislabeling, and not having an idea. So you should always ask what their pronouns are or how they identify, that's important. But things that can be mentioned are Adam's apples for men, right? Breast tissue for women. You can also point to development of muscle tissues in boys when they hit puberty and, you can and how their voices change. If any of you have any little brothers or older brothers that you got to experience puberty with, or for any of you men listening on here as well, think about when our voices were cracking, like, uh, making those weird noises. You're talking about the development of vocal patterns through Adam's apple, right? So the voice cracking. Uh, this is funny because I have a little nephew, Willem. He's about almost 13 now, and the dude has a lower voice than mine, but I remember when he had a high bell pitch voice. So you start seeing this, and it's something that you can establish behind constructions of the secondary sex characteristic. You can also think about this with women. You can think about the idea of breast tissue. You can think about the hair growth, as well as how we socially understand that. That ties some ways in the gender as well. But society, in an attempt to be more inclusive and less exclusive, also have used the term female-bodied and male-bodied to help awareness of those who have transitioned to being categorized as female, but were born male or vice versa, right? So new terms, labels, categories change all the time in society, and it's still being constructed to our understanding in it every single day, right? How we understand the world changes. It's not just one absolute truth. Uh, new terms, labels, categories, but it is in these, new two, in these two ways that we look and understand the idea of sex and sociology of the primary and the secondary. You can read this slide. I, it's a little making simplified what I said, but this is how we're looking at it. So when you think of sex in this class, remember that it's sex is a term we use to discussing a person's sexual characteristics, primary and secondary. That's something you need to take from this for your quizzes. So going from there, let's talk about something that's a little bit more 
of a dive into the sociological imagination because sociology has had, for better or worse, I think it's for better, much reputation as being the field that talks about gender and sex and all these different topics because we have a look at it from a social perspective, the guise of understanding, right? Gender. On this case, gender is in of itself entirely a social construction to build personas, labels and understandings of what is to be expected or anticipated for us, right? Our statuses and roles as members of society based on our actions, the way we dress, how we act, right? This is very gendered. How this is understood, taught, and displayed has changed through time and time again and again and again and again, right? You have so many different ways that gender has been reestablished. So the idea of masculinity and femininity associated with social control and the social dynamics of these times we live in, it's an idea of how we're starting the renaissance and change this. It has never been an absolute fact and it has changed as I've mentioned through generations. What is male to your parents' generation and your grandparents' generation, how a man should act is not the same as that is perceived in 2022. And it won't be the same as it is in probably 2023, four or five and et cetera, because we're adjusting this augmentation of how we view it on a regular basis. And the same goes with what is considered female or feminine, right? Historically, even when I was in high school, Professor McQueen, my old self from 35, the idea of gender was very much based upon the gender binary or male, female. And it was socialized as such. Most of your parents and grandparents went through this as well. And like I said, with my generation, I'm just a millennial, Professor McQueen's generation. It is a big topic at the moment. And we are entering a new construction of social engagements as we speak within these times of exploring what really is gender, right? So for importance of value on the slide, gender refers to the things that we socially associate with being either seen as female or male or masculine or feminine, right? Femininity is a term associated with women and masculinity is associated with men. Gender ideologies is set in the idea of society guiding the way we think about gender and how that means. Gender roles are much more associated with the idea of how we perceive a man and how he should be tough, silent, and emotionless. Women are supposed to be cultivating new, um, a little emotional, et cetera, right? We have these types of roles that you're supposed to play. And these change over time because it's a social construction of reality. It's a managed impression. So on to the next slide here. These are just some categories, right? Some gender identities, There's plenty more, right? Gender, I love an answer that was on TikTok. How many genders are there? Uh, infinite, the person said, because it's really how you see yourself. That's kind of cool. I, I wish that had been around for my time. And here are some types of gender associations and the ways that we do labels. That's important here. So, right, I also want to point out, even as we are moving towards equity and equality, we are still celebrating, sorry, we are still creating labels and bookmarks. Why? If we are to say that gender is a social construction and it's fluid, right, and we're trying to remove this label and this me mechanism of why we do and create the labels that we do, th then why do we still maintain these types of labels? Transgender, gender fluid, non-binary, bigender, cisgender, omnigender, gender expansive, et cetera, et cetera. We're still creating labels like we're a census to understand it because our brain likes to do this. We like to understand things quickly so that we can go about with our day. But I just want to add that this is interesting. Right? It's an interesting idea that we're still creating labels, we're just making more labels. So is that the, is that the solution? I don't know, talk about it on Yellow Dig. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But I also wanted to add as a lucky strike extra, you may not get that reference, but uh, when I was in high school, the apex of society in establishing different roles and understanding gender and statuses according to the idea of how we define ourselves was the term metrosexual. I don't even know if this is used these days. That being said, I would have been greatly benefited from the ability to find ways to understand myself that are being opened up to now. It was very much, you're a man, you're a woman, or you're gay, was how it was in my generation. And then we had this idea of if you do this and you do that, you are somebody who falls in these categories. If you like fashion, you're gay, because that wasn't considered manly. So since I didn't follow a prototypical example of what was seen to be a man, I was a wrestler, state wrestler. I was a video game nerd. I was also somebody into fashion. I played all the contact sports. You know, I did all these different variations of who I am. I was not really matching any of the set binary. So it really made me question and wonder about myself when I really had no need to as I've gotten older, I realized who I am. But these ideas of these categories open doors, but it's interesting to think about it. How many doors are we gonna just keep opening doors? Is that the solution? We just keep making infinite doors? Or do we come to an understanding that this is a social construction and it really doesn't need to have the labelization it has? I don't know, talk about it on yellow tape. I find it fascinating. I'm not gonna play these videos for you, but uh, the idea of associations behind gender is not something new and also is not something as restrictive as it used to be. Uh, indigenous cultures have what they refer to as two-spirit, a person who identifies as having both masculine and feminine spirit in the blend of the two. 
Uh, this video is great if you want to watch it. Fafain is a term used for Samoan culture. People transition back and forth between the masculine or feminine. And it's something that was understood. Uh, two spirits believe that you were actually blessed if you maintained both spirits of this because you had the wisdom of both genders. So gender played a large role in associating a lot of cultures. There was a lot of breakdown based upon the secondary sex characteristics of how we can get tasks and jobs done, right? And try to find an effective way. But people also understood that not everybody's the same. Not everyone's particular. There are people who don't match and it was praised for it. These are great TikToks if you want to watch. Fafafin is all about- So quick thing here, this is just a cool way to look at the idea of representation, gender and sex, right? I encourage you to share your thoughts about this on Yellow Dig. Gender being your mind, expression being how your body, orientation being who you love, and sex is simply just your reproductive organs. I think it's an interesting visual. I hope you like it. But let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about gender identity and sexual orientation. So as the slide says, I'm just gonna clear a slide in this one. Gender identity refers to a person's deep sense of their own gender or their own selves, right? In gender binary, it was male, man, masculine, and female, woman, and feminine. Uh, that was a very limited scope, but now we're looking at this idea of how we can break down what a gender identity means to our sexual orientation and our orientation towards our self-value. Sexual orientation refers to our attraction to others. This is not based on anything to do with gender identity. It's just how we feel, right? I'll go back to the slide with the heart. Heteronormativity would be the idea of same of man and woman culture being the norm and everyone should follow this. Heterosexuality is assumed male with female. Uh, many cultures have basis on where you've seen homophobia and that the, the norm or the time, the thing that was the most common was man and woman. Uh, and then you also have other ways of looking at sexuality, right? Bisexuality, pansexuality, asexuality, homosexuality, heterosexuality, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, how you define yourself. It really just comes down to what is you and what is you is gonna be comfortable to your own sense. So it really is a personal evaluation. And I think that the expansive social category of gender identity plays a large role in this. Now, this is something I wanted to bring up here. It's a powerful slide. If you're not familiar with Alfred Kinsley, uh, he made the Kinsley scale and you're looking at it. And uh, sexuality essentially is a continuum, not a strict dichotomy. 10% of the population is exclusively homosexual, 10% is heterosexual. That leaves an 80% variant of people who are kind of between zero and six. But Alfred Kinsey, as the slide shows, was very controversial in his time. In the late 40s, he made the Kinsey Report, which determined the truth that there was only 20% of the population that strictly is straight or gay, and that the rest of the 80% really kind of is exploring the way that they're looking, right? We don't go certain ways. The truth of his study, as it so happens, is that, as I just said, 80% fell somewhere in between the one and five, not the zero and six. And this was, uh, it was not well received at a time of rampant homophobia and heteronormative society. Think about the 1940s and telling everybody that 80% of y'all are pretty much not 100% straight or 100% gay. It just, it would not have been received well. If you're interested, if this fascinates you, let me give you some data, right? So if you're just in the data from this, it comes from 1948 to 1953, where Kinsey did an in-depth face-to-face interviews, also called qualitative research for your research methods information, of 5,300 white males and 5,940 white females. So there's definitely a racial bias that needs to be looked at. But what you're looking at is a large sample size over a long period of time. 30% of the males and 13% of the females had at least some overt homosexual experience. 10% of males were more or less exclusively homosexual and 8% of the males were exclusively for at least three years between the ages of 16 and 55. 4% of males and 1.1 1. 1 to 3% of females had been exclusively homosexual after the onset of adolescence up to the time of the interview. And uh, this, doesn't, this didn't just happen in the 40s and the 50s, right? This has been redone over and over again through the Kinsey Institute, if you want to look up this data. The Kinsey Institute was later established, and in 2011, the sample was looked at again to look at this validity scientific method. you got to mess around and find out. It has been reevaluated. The new sample was of 13,495 men and women between 2006 and 2008, attempted to differentiate between sexual attractiveness, sexual behavior, and sexual identity. Homosexual representation came in at about 2 to 4% of males and about 1 to 2% of females. Four to six percent of males had some same sex contact and for and for the female, the percentages who have been the same sex contact ranges from about four percent in comparison in the general social survey, which is like the gold standard of data to the 11 to 12 percent in the 2002 and 2006 and eight. Uh, national survey of family growth. So what you're seeing is that it's still showing salience, right? This data was powerful and challenging when it was established. And the Kinsey score is even referred to in shows today as like the show Hacks, if you haven't watched that show, and many movies as well. Think about the social deviance it would have been viewed as in the times of the 40s. Think about how it's even challenged you today. Data is powerful. And it's interesting when we find correlative ideas that actually match the correlation and fill and causation. What are your thoughts? We'd love to hear about your thoughts on Yellow Dig.
A uh, little tying him said with challenge and continued the research of Kinsey with the connection to queer theory and coined the term homosocial and looked at the interactions on day-to-day -day basis between the understanding of men and women and how we're socialized, right? So homosocial was a term she used. One powerful thing I like to bring up in this course, and I usually ask this and have the class respond to it, but if you were walking around ASU and you're on campus and you saw two dudes holding hands and being a little bit of affectionate with each other, is this normal? Would you think they're gay? What about if you saw two women holding hands and being affectionate? Are they lesbian? Would it even cross your mind? Why or why not? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd like to have this conversation on Yellow Dig. Please share with me. But this is also to say, and this is important to bring up, culture, ethnicity also play a large role into our compression management, as we talk about with Goffman, right? Historically, Black culture has had a less than positive view towards homosexuality, and many times would use terminologies to avoid talking about it, saying this is a low, down low brother, or they'd also just say this is a family problem, don't talk about it. So lack of representation, lack of acceptance. This has had major impacts on the LGBTQ plus community within the communities of color and minorities in general. Many times it's been hard to have more intersections of minority status that add to people looking at you differently. Uh, majority culture, let's look at the idea of Caucasian cultures are not exactly living our best lives in this either, but the connection of the communities of color is important to mention all as it is still a major issue of discrimination in communities that are already facing discrimination. So this idea of homosocial behavior is very much damned by many people in various communities and especially those of minority status and especially within the black community. Uh, the idea of Dude, if you do that, you're gonna be gay, bro. Don't be gay, bro. This was something that went on in my generation. Uh, if I did anything, they'd call me a fag or gay. And that was just like saying, hey, or they, like it was just a word you said. It was really powerful and sad to look back at from my perspective. Uh, sexual orientation. I'm just gonna add this on here. I'm gonna clear this up quickly for you. Uh, look at the information. Essentially at a young age, we're aware through the, Amer through the APA. The, the, by in 2008 that most people are aware of their sexual orientation at a pretty young age so it's not something that is just kind of like expository many people are aware according to the american psychological association uh, there's no scientific reason why an individual holds hetero homo or bisexual orientation we don't have any data on that but we do have data that shows that once they do classify themselves as homosexual or bisexual unequal treatment occurs even in schoolyards it's sad uh, it's because when things aren't notified they're created as deviants and that deviance is then transferred into problems so stereotypes can usually be created as unequal treatment with the LGBT communities. Think about media representation. It's always the gay best friend or the gay this or gay that in the sense of not being the main character. Name me many shows. If you can name me 10 shows where the character is not strictly queer TV in the sense it's not aimed only at an audience, but a general audience where the character, the main character is gay, I'd love to hear some better representations because a lot of times it's been very archetypical. It's been very stereotypical and media represents what people see who don't experience it in their lives. So this builds a bias, it's unfortunate. Cool video to watch, I think it's really interesting. Uh, it's kind of a little bit longer, I'm not gonna play here, but definitely watch it, student submission. Y'all go watch this. But uh, I'm gonna talk about gender performances on the next slide. I'm gonna cut the lecture short here, just cause I don't wanna overwhelm you. But there's some really good questions to ask here. Gender roles, we'll talk about, but what about gender? Why is it so socially powerful? What about sex being just based on the two characteristics? What about the Kinsey report? Do you find that interesting? I would love to hear some thoughts on Yellow Dig and I'll see you in the next lecture.